So good morning, evening, afternoon, however and wherever you're listening today. Welcome back to That Racing History Podcast, brought to you as always by me, Aidan Millward. Now today I thought I would look at the history of a car rather than a person, a team, a series or race because I like to cover everything here, not just Formula 1, although I probably should do something that isn't Formula 1 related very soon. So today I've got the story of one of the most dominant machines to ever participate in the Formula 1 World Championship, and it's also an icon. Today, ladies and gentlemen, I've got the story of the majestic and inimitable Ferrari F2004. Now let's face it, Ferrari was unstoppable in the early 2000s, because five straight titles to Michael Schumacher in which he won the majority of his 91 wins and then that took him to a total of seven world titles. A record that stood for so long and was beaten only recently by he who must not be named. Purely because it would just degrade into a salt fest on the YouTube version that will no doubt mention how it was all the car. And I won't also go into the political side of things and whether Mosley and Bernie were giving them a helping hand because that isn't relevant to the story. We're leaving all of that out. We're focusing on just the car. So if you're one of these people getting ready to type show us on the doll where Ferrari hurt you or you're just a jealous bitter Brit, well, you're out of luck. Plus, imagine only having 91 wins. Let's be honest, what have I got to be jealous of? Now snark aside, let's get down to the nitty gritty of the car because that's why we're here. Now like virtually all Formula 1 cars within a time frame of regulations, the F2004 was simply an evolution of what came before. Because back then, the regulations were a little more stable with very few, if any, major regulation changes between 1995 and 2009. And by major, I mean stuff that drastically changed the looks of the car, like how the 2008 and 2009 cars were so different, and the 2016 and 2017 cars. And obviously we're going to see that change again in 2022 when they go back to being sucky boys. Just to list off some examples, in 1996 we saw the mandatory introduction of the high cockpit sides and the banning of aero deflectors in front of the rear wheels. So the 1995 cars, with improvements, got to run through to the end of 1997. In 1998 we saw the introduction of a narrower track and groove tyres, but the bodywork was merely a simple evolution. You can see bits of the 1997 Williams in the 1998 one, the 1997 Ferrari in the 1998 one, and so on. If you were to look at the Ferrari from 2001 up to 2004 from just the side profile, you'd be forgiven for thinking they're effectively the same car with some minor upgrades. But really, the F2004's oldest relative was the equally dominant F2002, rather than the 2001 car. Now, The 2002, designed by Ross Braun and Rory Byrne, was much lighter than the older brother and had much better handling due to its stupidly low centre of gravity. Now the engine wasn't as powerful as the BMW in the Williams or the Mercedes in the McLaren, but it was less thirsty and lighter, which was all a complete departure from Enzo Ferrari's ethos of power being the winner and not aero or lightness. And aero and lightness was a philosophy applied by Lotus and the rest of the British teams. But still, it produced around 820 to 900 horsepower at 19,000 revolutions a minute, and it weighed just 600 kilos. Much lighter than F1 cars of today, and much, much smaller. And Bridgestone were making tyres specifically for that car, and the whole package, together with Michael Schumacher, it dominated. And it dominated hard. Because in 2002, Ferrari won six of the opening seven rounds of the championship, the only one it not winning being Monaco, and then we had that finish at Austria. But still, after 19 rounds of the championship, Ferrari had won 15 of them. From around 1996 to 2001, Ferrari had been using the same basic design of gearbox, but that gearbox design received an overhaul for 2002. They were now making gearboxes out of titanium to make it even lighter, and Braun and Byrne overhauled the aerodynamics and moved the exhaust to blow hot air onto the rear wing for added stability, and away from the rear suspension. And just as a quick point before the anoraks arrive, the F2002 didn't debut until round 3 at Interlagos using a modified F2001 for Melbourne and Kuala Lumpur. Yep, back in those days, Interlagos was at the beginning of the season rather than near the end. Now interestingly, there was a small kerfuffle surrounding that car and its debut in Brazil. The team only took one F2002 to Interlagos, which naturally went to Schumacher, with his spare car being an F2001 and Barrichello using an F2001. 
The two cars used different wheel rims and different spec tyres, so in effect, Schumacher had twice the allocation of tyres of any other driver on the grid, because he's got tyres specific for his F2002 and his F2001. The car then dominated the rest of the season at a level not seen since 1988 or 1992, with Schumacher winning 9 in the F2002 and 11 overall in the season, with teammate Barrichello getting 4 wins. The only race the F2002 failed to win was Monaco, with the F2001 only failing to win in Sepang. Schumacher meanwhile finished every race on the podium and won the title in record time, with Ferrari ending the Constructors' Championship with as many points as the rest of the other teams combined. So how could they possibly beat that? 2003 was a much closer fight, with Williams and McLaren able to close up, and there was a three-way fight for the title lasting until the final couple of rounds. Then in mid-2003, Ferrari brought the F2003 GA, with GA being a tribute to Gianni Agnelli, the recently deceased head of Fiat. The 2003 car wasn't quite as overpowered as the previous year's car, with the F2003 having a penchant for being too heavy on the tyres, which caused a lot of problems for Ferrari during the European-wide heatwave of that year. Despite those drawbacks, Schumacher won six races that year to take title number six, with Barrichello winning two races, and Schumacher winning the title by just two points from Kimi Raikkonen. So then we get to 2004. Aldo Costa, Rory Byrne and Ross Braun took all the best parts of the 2002 Monster and the best bits of the 2003 car and made them have a little baby together. The periscope exhaust were made smaller and brought more towards the centre of the car to improve the aerodynamic efficiency even further. The rear wing was made slightly bigger and the suspension fine-tuned to reduce the excessive tyre wear that plagued them in 2003, especially in hotter weather. There were new FIA rules to consider too. The car had to last a whole race weekend, so a more durable gearbox was top of the list, as well as making sure that the engine was more reliable. The wheelbase was made shorter than the F2003 and the gearbox software had to be changed. The FIA had banned fully automatic shifting again and had also banned the use of launch control. Again. Although, traction control was still allowed, and you can hear it kicking in on any of the onboards of this era. While the cars had flappy paddles on the back, teams were typically using an automated upshift and manual downshift pattern, with launch control helping at the start with an automated clutch. For 2004, it was back to using flappy paddles to go up and down the gearbox, and then use the clutch on the rear of the steering wheel and they found a way to make it even lighter still, with further advancements made in materials and construction. The weight distribution was improved, the centre of gravity lowered even further than before, and the mechanical package much more durable and reliable. And testing started at Fiorano, and when it was established it worked and wasn't going to kill anybody, Ferrari took it to Imola where they could test it back to back with the old car. Because back then, testing was pretty much unlimited and not to when and where the FIA said you could test. Using the data collected from the previous year and provided the car can keep the tyre temperatures under control, Braun and the crew reckon that the new car should be half a second quicker than the old one. But then Schumacher went two seconds quicker. But instead of sitting there wide-eyed and thinking they'd created some sort of umbrella corporation style super weapon that would make them invincible or some sort of red cruise missile, Ferrari was convinced it had overdone it with regards to the technical regulations of Formula 1. So they stuck it on a weigh bridge, and it was well within the minimum weight limits. They put it on a dyno, and the power output was consistent, and then they checked the timing sheets, with Imola's inbuilt timing system, which was you know regulated by the FIA and homologated by the FIA, all of that was consistent with their own onboard data on the car, and their own stopwatches. Meanwhile, the Michael was grinning like a Cheshire cat, and was secretly hoping that this car was the final car, and not a massive cock-up. It wasn't, and even more weirdly, the car was better over the course of a race distance, and not just over one lap. McLaren and Williams had good cars over one lap, but the Ferrari got better and better as the distance went up. Barrichello tested it at Mugello and said that the F2004 was the only car he could take some of Mugello's fastest corners without even lifting. And with Ferrari now the only top team running Bridgestone tyres, the Japanese company was now putting more focus on that car and making tyres to suit that car, and then just supplying the same tyres to Sauber, Jordan and Minardi where they didn't work so well. 
Like in 2002, Schumacher won the opening five races, and then retired at Monaco after colliding with Juan Pablo Montoya in a bizarre incident behind the safety car, the results of which allowed Jano Trulli to take his only win. But that little hiccup didn't stop the prancing horse. It went on to claim 15 wins in an 18-race season, with The Michael winning 13 of them. It's a record for most wins by a driver in a season until Sebastian Vettel took 13 wins in the 2013 season. And ironically, both these feats came at the end of their respective domination years. At Melbourne, Schumacher had half a second over Montoya and Button, who set the same lap time. He was a full second faster than Alonso in the Renault. Then in the race, Schumacher won by 13 seconds from Barrichello, and was a further 22 or so ahead of Alonso in third. Although the caveat here is that in those days, massive gaps between the cars were common. The next round at Malaysia was closer, with Schumacher winning by 5 seconds from Montoya, but normal service resumed at Bahrain, when Schumacher was just over half a second ahead of Barrichello, and then 26 seconds ahead of Jensen Button in third. Now had Schumacher finished in Monaco, it would have been 13 races won in a row since the start of the season, as opposed to 13 over the course of the season. Aside from Monaco, Schumacher also finished every race, but would finish 12th in China and 7th in Brazil, although by that point he was champion anyway and was just racing for fun at that point. Such was Ferrari's domination that year, there were only four teams on the top step of the podium. Ferrari, Renault, McLaren and Williams. In addition, Ferrari were the only team out of those four to have both drivers win a race, and on top of that, they were the only team to have drivers win more than one race. The Schumacher and Ferrari's dominance also overshadowed the fact that Jensen Button in a BAR Honda finished a comfortable third in the championship, finishing with a 26-point gap to Alonso, who would take the championship the following year. Ferrari continued to use the F2004 as a testbed and as a way of developing the next year's car, the F2005. Reliability wasn't so much of an issue, because while Schumacher and Barrichello had both failed to finish one race each in 2004, both of those retirements were through collisions, and not an actual fault on the car. Schumacher's was caused by hitting the brakes in the tunnel at Monaco, whereupon Montoya hit him up the rear, and Barrichello's was caused through a collision with David Coulthard at the Japanese Grand Prix. But compared to 2004, the F2005 would go on to be a failure. Further rule changes from the FIA mandated, for some weird reason, a set of tyres had to last through qualifying and the race, which produced a comedy show at Indianapolis. And on top of that, Ferrari had to rush the F2005 into service to keep up with Renault and McLaren, who had the early edge in the season. They'd basically done what Williams had done in 1994, Williams had taken a dominant 1993 car and then just basically run it without its driver aid software and active suspension. Ferrari had taken the F2004, again dominant, and then updated the suspension and made some other changes to try and preserve tyre life as much as possible. There was also another rule change for 2005. The front wings were higher than the previous year to try and reduce front end grip, with teams having to find grip from the diffusers and that didn't sit well with the rest of the car. The way the F2004 packaged the gearbox and the engine didn't allow Ferrari much wiggle room to make the most of this new concept. Much like how they'd packaged the cars at the start of the ground effect era, their flat 12s being almost incompatible with the ground effect systems. So all this added up meant Ferrari would have their worst season on record since 1995, and they only took one win. That race at Indianapolis. Although the 2006 car would prove way more competitive, it wasn't until 2007 that Ferrari would win another title with Kimi Raikkonen. It is, as of 2021, the last driver's championship for Ferrari on record. So the F2004, in a way, was the swan song of the Ferrari dominance years of the early 2000s. But instead of fizzling out like Williams or even McLaren have done, they went out with a flamboyant bang. Well, it is an Italian company after all. The F2002 was the precursor, but the F2004 is the one that we all remember. For Ferrari fans, it's the holy grail. For non-Ferrari fans, it was a pain in the ass. However, as I've aged and now done a little bit more research on it, I've come to appreciate the car a little more now than when I did when it was in service, in inverted commas. And sure, nobody wants to watch the same people winning all the time and dominance is boring, 
regardless of whether it's the New England Patriots, Ferrari, Manchester United, Barcelona, and yes, even Lewis Hamilton today. But it's amazing how opinions can change over time, and with that little bit of the old rose-tinted goggles. Sometimes, accomplishment is so spectacular that we need about 16 years for it to sink in. And this race is where the dominance of Michael Schumacher ended. Michelin made better tyres. Except for that one race, obviously. And Fernando Alonso stopped the juggernaut that was the red team for Maranello. A run of six constructors' titles. Something only Mercedes has bettered. But five drivers' titles in a row. That's something that not even Fangio, Senna, Clark or Hamilton can do. Now, prior to the year 2000, Ferrari had been waiting since Jody Schechter in 1979 for a driver's title. And since the days of the early 21st century, the Tifosi, Ferrari's die-hard fans, go into every season hoping that maybe, just maybe, those days will be back. If only for one season. And it almost happened. 2017, 2018, they had a great chance of beating Mercedes, but Ferrari and Vettel crumbled. Between 2000 and 2005, that black horse on a yellow shield trampled all who challenged it. Great for those that love Ferrari, but for the rest of us, boy did we love to hate them. You'd be hard pushed to find somebody who likes Formula 1 that doesn't have the F2004 in their top 5 list of iconic Formula 1 cars. It's up there with the MP44, the FW15C, the Lotus 49 and whatever other car you choose to fill that gap with. It's also, annoyingly for me at least, one of the best looking. Sleek, neat, lacking all the aero appendages that sprouted a couple of years later. Not that the other drivers got to see how good it looked on track, because it was so far ahead they weren't even able to see the back of it. Well, Montoya got a good look at the back of it when he ploughed into it. Now people, especially today, love to cry about how it's the car that got that driver his wins especially if that driver is one you don't particularly like. So I'd like to pose a question to everybody listening to this right now. Would Zolt Baumgartner, who drove for Minardi that year, have won the title in the F2004? Doubt it. He'd have probably won a race, but I doubt he would have won the title. Would Esteban Gutierrez have won the title in the 2015 Mercedes? Probably not, but he'd probably win a couple of races. And if they did win the championship, would it have been as easy as the Michael or Lewis made it for themselves? No. This is the thing with Formula 1. If you have an already great car, and then stick the best driver of that generation in said great car, so Clark in 1963, Senna in 1988, Schumacher in 2004, Hamilton in 2020, Vettel in 2013, you do that, then it becomes the quickest and easiest way to win a world championship. In 2018, five records were still claimed by that car. But with the way the cars are now, with their wide tyres and super powerful hybrid engines, those records are slowly getting beaten as days go by. And the car will be consigned to the history books. But at least, a lot of us listening to this podcast can say, we were there to watch it. So then it begs the question, which car or which team will go and better that? There are more rules in place these days regarding engines and there are now cost caps and longer seasons so consistency is harder to maintain. Not even Mercedes has been able to have their number one driver win so many races in a season. I guess a lot of people are going to be pointing towards Max Verstappen to do that but anything can happen in Formula 1 and it usually does. So this has been the full story of the Ferrari F2004, how it dominated the year and how it became a benchmark for all dominant cars to beat in the 21st century. So if you've learned something new and or enjoyed this, then YouTube listeners can like the video and if you're new, subscribe so you get all the latest. And for those listening on Spotify, if you've been recommended this because of other stuff you listen to, then why not consider following to get fresh pieces of motorsport history delivered straight to your inbox. That Racing History Podcast is a Patreon-backed show, and if you wish to help support this podcast or just my YouTube channel in general at a more personal level, then you can do so by heading to the Patreon page at patreon.com slash Aidan Millward. That's A-I-D-A-N-M-I-L-L-W-A-R-D. So Aidan with an A and not an E. And you can also follow me on Twitter, Instagram, and all that good stuff. And there is also a Discord where you can join in the chat there. 
For YouTube listeners, all that stuff is handily in the description box for you. So until next time, I've been Aidan Mild with That Racing History Podcast. Have a great day wherever you are, and goodbye. <laughs>